All right. Hi, good morning, everyone. We have Sarah Jean Rosito today. This is Seeking Sustainability Live number 56. It's July 9th. Seeking Sustainability is a, a project to try to find people around Japan who are doing good things for community and for the environment. And Sarah Jean has done so much with so many different NGOs and so much activism. So I'm really looking forward to talking to you, Sarah Jean. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here today. Um, it's really exciting too to think about sustainability in a broad sense, not just environment is very important, but what about people and community and how we treat each other? Thank Definitely. you. Definitely. Yeah. I think a lot of people have a more narrow focus. When I say mm -hmm. sustainability, they're just thinking about the environment only, picking up plastic, reducing plastic. Right. But the kinds of community projects that you do is really about building people and then people right. can help the environment. And I think that's a great focus. Thanks so much, yeah. And of course the environment is important, but it's one part of our lives, right? And I think that the communities in which we work, live, environment is one aspect, but we can't leave out the people part, right? Whether it's how we treat each other, are we tolerant, for different, tolerant of differences, or how we deal with people who are similar to us. Um, you know, there's many things for us to consider when we're talking about sustainable communities, right? Definitely. Let's, let's start with a bit of background about you. Can you tell sure. us the kind of work that you've done? Wow, okay. So <laughs> <laughs> let's start with training and skills development, because I have yeah, that on screen. That's my main focus. That is really my main focus of my work. And really, I've been doing that since my university days. And to just give you a little bit of background, m many people are surprised about this. But originally, when I was going to university, I wanted to be an engineer because I was kind of a math and science geek. But I fell in love with the theater. And so I became a drama major. Wow. And so it's quite a fluke of nature how I became an activist. I was involved in this experimental theater group when I was 19 or 20 years old. And um, for some reason, everybody trusted me with their car. So somebody at a rehearsal threw me a set of car keys and said, could you go to JFK um, Airport in New York City and pick up these guys from South Africa? They'll be in purple robes. What is this? I had no idea. I was like, yeah, yeah, okay. I love to drive. I used to love to drive. <laughs> Um, and so I went down to JFK, I found them right away, had their names. Anybody ever heard of Bishop Desmond Tutu? Um, so there I am. I didn't at the time. Wow. Uh, yeah. So talk about life changing. And I was to drop them off at a church in the Bronx, got lost. I ended up being in the car with them for a long time. Um, so they were in the U S this was the mid eighties to, uh, promote, their anti-apartheid work and talk about the ANC, African National Congress. And um, really from that time, I became involved in the divestment movement, um, getting companies in universities, our focus because we were university students, getting universities to divest from all businesses doing work in South Africa. I mean, really spending those hours in the car with these guys, I'm sure I totally unimpressed them with my lack of knowledge, my lack of like, oh really? That's interesting. Uh, <laughs> you know, you're 19 years old, you're a theater person, you're like, oh yeah. Um, but it really moved me talking to them and I got really involved um, in the next semester after the student leaders in my university graduated, I became a core activist. And then in my last year, I became more of an activist as well but not just in this issue, also in uh, uh, violence against women, anti-violence against women, obviously. Um, that This was a big theme, uh, was a bit really not quite the start, but almost start of the Take Back the Night movement, where is the, the discussion that women should be able to walk freely at night. Um, you know, we started with small things like putting lights, getting lights in different places, and security patrols and those type of things. It's easy to take for granted now, but we didn't even have the word sexual harassment. There were no ombuds people. There were no systems in place in universities at that time. So, but we're still fighting for these things around the world. These issues are still important, 
but we started with really small things. So since that time, I really went to more of a, a focus, not necessarily on acting, but really on how the arts can help promote social awareness and social justice. Yeah, nice. I saw you were part of a play a few years ago in Tokyo. Maybe you're with a bunch, but um, focusing on women empowerment. Yeah. Was, was it a doll's house? I want to... It was, it's called Seven. Okay. Actually. It's about seven different women. I produced it and I was one of the seven women. It was 2016. I saw the play read. It's usually done as a reading in 2015 when I was at an international women's conference in Prague. And I said, oh, I would like to do this play in Japan. So um, I bought the script when I was in New York later that year. And the person, I knew who I would have to contact. There's only one person in Tokyo I would ever even think about doing. That's Rachel Walzer. She's an amazing, she has a background in social justice theater in Israel. So she knows about this work. And she's an amazingly sensitive person, like as a director, as a team leader. And that's who you would need to do a play that focused on seven themes, such as honor rape, a trafficking, of women and girls, freedom of speech. Um, Northern Ireland was not just about religion, but the gaps, the rich poor gaps, and, as well as poverty and how people are suppressed politically, as well as religiously. Um, oh, domestic violence, um, as really complex, the one about Guatemala, but indigenous people who are poor and being politically suppressed. So you need somebody who's not only knowledgeable about those issues, knowledgeable about theater, but how do you bring a group of amateur actors who really want to get a message across? And then actually she created a play around it. And it's basically monologues, but she was actually able to create a multimedia experience with such an amazing group of people. We had, I, you know, just when I think about those people in that time, and people from about 14 different countries were involved in the show itself, seven lead women, and there were 19 smaller parts, some male, some female, movement, musicians. Uh, wow, that sounds and amazing. And I mean, through the arts, what a great way to show your activism, because it's it's more of a creative genre, but it kind of it taps into a wider audience that maybe wouldn't go to a demonstration or wouldn't and, listen to a lecture, right? And who wouldn't go to an ordinary musical, unless it's maybe Hamilton, okay? <laughs> um, so the, the makeup of the audience was quite unusual. Maybe about 40, 50% were the English theater world people come to any show that's in English. And maybe another chunk of people who, as you said, would never go to, you know, something that's a demonstration or, or actually one person who came was so interesting because I shared it with all my NGO friends, somebody who was leaving the next day to go to do her NGO, his work in Pakistan. So one of our characters was in Pakistan and he just was like, he said, this was so amazing because he's so focused in the NGO world. You never get this arts experience that has any sensitivity about these issues. It's great, you know, Kinky Boots, great, love it. Rocky Horror Picture Show, you know, great Tokyo International Players does that kind of stuff that's great. Um, a Black Stripe, whom we, theater company, whom we did it through. Um, but, and uh, this is not really something that's planned, but um, before COVID came in, Rachel and I were thinking, okay, what can we do in 2020? Okay, now it's, what can we do in 2021? Because I have a stack of scripts. She has some, she did a play about a domestic violence case that happened uh, last year, which I supported her on. Um, but now we're thinking, who knows, next year, maybe when we, we can get people together, but um, theater is yeah. still kind of sketchy, bringing people in, in a really tight space. Yeah. We'll see what happens. Oh, that's true. Maybe more outdoor performances would be would yeah. be great. There are some great outdoor arenas in Japan, right? Like yeah. in the parks yeah. and stuff. So maybe yeah. maybe utilize that more. Mm -hmm. um, so you've you've done women marches. Um, yes. There was a project in Tohoku. 
that you were doing for women? I mean, you've, you've done a lot with gender awareness and supporting. Is that something that you also, of course, have in the SDGs or in your training and yeah. skills development? It's always a part, right? Yeah. You know, and I, I guess for myself, I think as an American woman and also as my, my father, whom I consider to be quite conservative, but I realized you know, he really wanted to be a lawyer. He was always like, there's no need to get married early. My parents got married in their mid thirties. Um, you know, yeah. And no, I'm the only person in my family who even got even married. Um, so, uh, I didn't have pressure to get married, anything like that. My father was really strict about academic achievement with me, really strict. Um, it was never, I never had this kind of traditional role model that I had to fulfill, which I remember saying in university, I didn't understand women's studies courses. Now it's gender studies because, and I took a lot of them about work, social stratification, um, and a lot of it focused really on race and gender at that time, which was very simple compared to the way we think of it today. Uh, but I remember saying in class once, I'm already equal. I don't understand this idea of fighting for equal rights. And it wasn't until after university where I realized how complicated these things were. Um, maybe in part of it was going to an arts school where things are a little bit more open and alternative. But I realized, you know, coming up through various different programs, the gaps that exist. For example, I do a lot of work. I've been doing since 2005 trainings for JICA, the Japan International Cooperation Agency. And um, most i have been doing trainings for a lot of them have been focused on persons with disabilities, blind, deaf, physically disabled, uh, mostly physically disabled people. Um, and it's for people, mostly people from developing countries and also in the health field. Uh, people come from ministries of health and NGOs working in the health field. When they're government officials, they're by and large men. When they're NGO workers, it's a much bigger mix. And you can often see right in that room of 10 to 15 people, the gaps. And the people I've been working with, the Japan Society for the Rehabilitation of persons with disabilities really want to have a good mix of men and women because when we have had, say, only two women, their voices get drowned out. So I've always been pretty much aware that that's going to, that will happen. And it's not just, oh, people say, oh, it's just people from those countries. No, it isn't. If there's one thing that's universal, it really is gender bias. Yeah. So anytime somebody says it's their culture to do this, I was like, okay, so let's see, <laughs> there is no gender bias and oh, this country. Well, yeah, there is. Oh, okay. So that's unique to Japan because gender, we have hundred percent equality for women in the United States. No, it doesn't work that way. So, and I actually started courses on it based on participants interests, like adult education programs, because People were talking about it, and then there would be somebody who would say, but this isn't a gender issues course. This is a course about development, or this is a course about NGOs. Why are we talking about gender? Well, I was so happy to see that it's on the list of SDG targets for Japan because it's, of course, so important, yeah. and it should be on every country's list. Um, you must notice it when you teach university classes of mixed gender classes versus all women, that kind of thing as well. You, yeah. you see it in your training programs, right? Yeah. Yeah, I really do see it, you know, um, until recently, for example, in continuing education at, say, Temple University, for example, um, in the Japanese participants were by and large women. And the international participants were very diverse, male and female from different types of companies, different types of jobs. More recently, with SDG courses, it's almost all Japanese people and more men. And one of the reasons why is because they have their little SDG badge that they have to wear. You know, they come right from their office. They have, they have to wear that. Um, but they don't really know too much about what it means or they you know, they've been told, okay, you know, plastic is important, but how does this fit? And in all the NGO programs, courses, undergraduate adult programs, 
by and large, when it comes to Japanese participants, it's by and large women until very recently. It's kind of seen, it was kind of seen as something soft, you know, human rights. I mean, I was told that even in graduate school, I studied human rights in East Asia. And I was, you know, that soft, fluffy stuff. You know, torture isn't really soft and fluffy, no. <laughs> you know, but it's not, con- it's still something that people can't really grasp. One interesting thing about the SDGs that's different than the Millennium Development Goals that was the precursor is that it's much more, the role of gender equality or the position of gender equality is much more seen as connected to the other goals. It's not just, okay, we have these goals. Let's put girls in school. Let's get women in the workforce. Let's get women in parliament and and everything changes but that gender has to be part and parcel of water, of, of energy, decision-making, collaboration, of education, of food and agricultural, you know, food security and agri- uh, sustainable agriculture. And because now, if- I'm talking to uh, Wee Mori founder yesterday, also yeah. about forestry and planting trees and mm-hmm. small loans. You know, right. we, we see so much around the world where empowering women and putting women in charge or leadership positions helps the community, helps everybody. So it's, it's massive. Right. You know, well, we don't think about this maybe in developed countries, the important role women have in agriculture. I don't know the most recent figures, but when we think about really small scale farming, farming that's done by hand, women are majority of the workers there. It's when we get to like agribusiness and large scale farming where we have machinery where we have a lower ratio of women and we have more men, it's more business oriented. But when we think about South Asia, Sub-Saharan African countries, you know, it, it's a lot of women and children doing work by hand. Um, you can see this with migrant workers in a lot of developed countries as well. It isn't just men. Yeah. It's a lot of and women if, and children. And if you're teaching or giving, allowing people to grow their own food, it's going to be the moms and, and kids doing it, right? Yeah. So, yeah, self-sufficiency for food is, is a massive woman empowerment issue, I think. Um, let's switch gears a little bit. Can we focus more on uh, SDGs and your advice for small, medium-sized enterprises in Japan? Let's, let's talk about that a little bit, if you don't mind. Sure. You know, I think... And I want to start with this. A lot of people think SDG sustainable development is big. It's, you know, it's something for Suntory, McDonald's, right? Because they have this huge supply chain. Um, that's, that's very important. And as consumers, it's important we think about that. However, majority of businesses the, are small and medium size or micro businesses. And I don't remember the exact ratio, but it is a majority of the economies in the world are really dependent on small, medium, and micro economies. So when we think about small businesses, we don't necessarily have that supply chain to think about, but we do need to think about who are the people we work with? Are we being, say, open, say, in our, in thinking about whether customers, clients, or, um, you know, the, just the people in our networks, are we thinking about different types of people? So diversity comes in here, not just women, but ethnic, racial, um, religious minorities. I'm not a big fan of the word minority, but anyway, thinking about diverse people that we're working with, that's one way. And then there are practices. And this, I mean, this comes down where every person makes a difference, right? How do we... We don't have to have 100%, you know, the sustainable office, but what are the small things we can do? And it goes beyond, sorry, although I like the My Bottle, it starts with that, not using plastic bottles. It starts with that, but we need to think bigger than that. Like, what are the things we can do? And there are some, like, little checklists I've seen online, and maybe I'll share that in my SDG for SME workshop next week. I'm going to try to work on something that fits our life in Japan, but think about, okay, the environment in which we work. A lot of us are now working from home. It's actually much easier. We're working online. Do we really need all this paper? Do we really, there's really small steps we can all take. It's about who, it's about materials. 
And then thinking about the future as we develop new programs or new projects, what can we add to that? Can I share a specific example yes. of something? Sure. Yeah. I, a consulting project I was doing just before COVID happened. And it, unfortunately, it was in the tourism business. I'm hoping that they, once this travel time, once people get back to traveling, it'll work out. There's a small, amazing travel company in Tokyo called People Make Places. I don't know if you've heard of it or... Um, so they're really focused on the people in Japan, like this sushi shop, this sake maker, right? And bringing people to those places. And it's such an amazing idea, right? So they were doing well last year. So they had this idea, how can we create more, how can we incorporate sustainability into their tourism? So January and February, I ran um, a series, basically facilitating staff discussion. You know, what is, we started with what is sustainability. We started with some discussion like in the office and then for their tours. And the staff over like four meetings came up with in-house introducing to clients, meaning the people they visit, and then to their customers, the people, who, the tourists themselves. Um, you know, so facilitating that type of thing, like step by step, and I think the staff started to feel really empowered that these small things, uh, and just two very small examples, a lot of customers want water all the time, so get away from the bottled water. Yes, go to the Miami Zoo. And then they also have this idea, because they're working with a lot of small craftspeople, how can we have them make these things that the instead of using disposable chopsticks when they go to these different places and then it becomes also a, like a souvenir of japan right absolutely and a, a very high quality part of their branding right right so these little things that actually start becoming for the clients in the field this is a new product or maybe it's a product they're making but they hadn't been thinking about this as part of their tourism and then for the customers visiting these places, now they have something memorable, it's sustainable, and they're all contrib and it's a positive cycle, right? It's really positive. And it's a so win 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 from for people make places, the customers and the clients. And probably we can all start doing these things. Yeah, for sure. Right? One one of the things that I was doing uh tourism guide training and we would go to a very popular souvenir shop and they were selling furoshiki and yeah. they were selling high quality products but when you bought the high quality product they put it in a plastic bag and I said wouldn't it be an amazing service and kind of like uh, extra added value because you get to watch how they wrap it with fudoshiki. If you start selling fudoshiki yes. as a wrapping option and then they have it when they take it home, they have this story of you doing it and then learning more about Japanese culture. Now Lush is using fudoshiki style wrapping all over the world. But wow. why aren't we doing it in Japan? This is a Japanese yeah. culture, beautiful thing that we could do instead of plastic bags. So you're adding value, adding high quality, adding a wonderful branding and reducing waste at the same mm -hmm. time. So, you know, there are lots of ideas, I think. And you're right. The experience also stays with people, not just as a, as a great item, but also as something they can bring back in their habits when they go back to wherever they are, even if it's just going back to Tokyo from a small town in rural Japan. So an experience has a big impact on people changing their way of seeing and their way of behaving. Just telling people, bring your own bag, a little bit different. Yeah. Because people are, it goes in and out. Right. And how many times are you told by business people, but the plastic bag is part of the service? Well, right. change it out for a nice paper bag with your brand on right. or change it out for a fudoshiki with your brand on, right. right? Make it actually part of your service, right? Right. So it's the, it's the connecting all these dots, which long term has a big impact on people and on the planet and also economically, there's a positive 
there's a positive, definitely. But Absolutely. if we think long term, short term, mm -hmm. it's harder to think about it, right? Yeah. But long term, it's clear. That seemed like a great project. And of course, yeah. for tourism as well, focusing yeah. on people, training people, uh, supporting people is a great part of improving yeah. tourism, which is, it seems counterintuitive. It's all about the customer who's incoming. No, actually, if you take care of your staff, if you take care of local people, the visitor will also have a much more wonderful experience and your mm -hmm. local people will be happy and more welcoming. It, it all works together so beautifully. And it also adds you know, introduces a different type of tourist, a different type of face of Japan. People who want to go to Tokyo Disneyland, that's fine. You don't need to market to those people, right? People already know where Disney Sea is. You can book online, all that type of thing. And nothing against people who want to go to Disney Sea, but that's a known thing. Smaller restaurants, smaller makers of sake, smaller makers of particular goods, they don't have that access, right? right? So this also gives them access to more people and then the customers get access to a different way of seeing Japan. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Do you, you want to talk a little bit about the SDG city idea? Yeah, you know, I, um, I thought this was quite interesting because I've proposed this to several different groups and a lot of people say, oh, it's just greenwashing, whatever. People are jumping on the bandwagon. And that might be true, but it is the beginning of a great conversation between governments, civil society, and businesses about what can we do. Again, just deciding you have an SDG city doesn't bring about the change, right? So I don't know if your listeners know this, but Kobe, and I forgot where, I think it's Kochi in Shikoku recently, my Mizu was brought on to be one of those partners in this, this part of this promoting, not using so many plastic bottles, because it's a big issue for, for cities, but it also engages citizens. So when you have this three-party discussion, it's the outcome of that discussion that is important. The, be being designated as an SDG city is just really a beginning point to the action. That doesn't cause the outcome, right? It's, it's like a lot of things. Saying we have a goal doesn't mean we've achieved the outcomes. But it's the work that brings about the positive outcomes. And the work only comes when the different sectors, and also academia, universities, or elementary schools, we all need to be involved in this. But setting these, these aspirations, I believe, are really important for making a plan. Nobody makes a plan to do something without any ideas of what you want to achieve, right? Yeah, definitely. Do you include um, SDG Talk in your training programs? or? Yeah, and you know, there's a few reasons why I do it. One is um, in Japan, a lot of people, it's a really big uh, how can I say? It's a really big brand now, so people get a little bit excited, and sometimes it's a little hook. For non-Japanese people, many people have never heard of the SDGs, so it's a great way to make people feel like they're part of something global. You know, the significance of the Millennium Development Goals was really that was really to have for the first time all sectors, public, the government, private, the business sector, social society, universities, donor agencies, work together to say, how can we deal with poverty? There's been poverty since time immemorial. Poverty, hunger. Let's try to come up with some agreed targets, what we can do. And I think sometimes people get excited about feeling, oh, I'm part of something bigger, even though the steps are small, but that everybody has a role. Yeah. And I guess in a lot of ways, that's where my work is. I'm not working at the global summit. There's other people can work at the UN level and talk about the big picture strategy. I'm really focused on what's my, what's my part of, of whether it's gender-based violence. What can I do to promote tolerance? What can I do to improve skills of people in my community? Um, that's really where I see my, my focus is really the individual. Because mm -hmm. I believe every individual is important. 
Yeah. Well, let's talk about some of the things you have been doing. Um, mm -hmm. Was it just last night you had diversity and inclusion? Even yeah. you want to yeah. tell us about that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. So I've been part of this. It's it's a, like a, like a study group in a lot of ways called Diversity Dojo that started about three four years ago, and um, now it's been online. The last few months been going well. Um, we do at least one event a month. And last night, we it was a discussion forum. We have two types of workshops where it's like you learn new specific things or discussions where it's based on everybody's own knowledge experience. And we called it Inside Out because instead of doing a workshop on, okay, this is diversity, this is what you can do in your company. Are you including enough people? How do you do it? We decided to start it with, when do you feel included? When do you, what are things, whether it's words, behavior, that make you feel part of the group? And most of the time was spent in, in groups, people talking about their own experiences of feeling included or excluded, like they belong or didn't belong. And what were some of the commonalities? What were some of the differences? You know, and some of these are different by uh, age or by, you know, your socialization or just who we are as people. Right. But having that discussion and then coming up with some ideas, what did I learn from this and what could I do to be more inclusive? Uh, overall, it seemed to go really well. I know some people really suspect, you know, we're going to just sit and talk about it. Well, actually, everybody who is there is really interested in how do we include people. But maybe we don't, as one person said, I don't reflect on my own experience. Mm -hmm and talk about to other people, well, if you did this, if somebody did this, I would feel more included. Right. Um, or I'm, I feel excluded when somebody does X, Y, or Z. And I was a little nervous about how it would go at first, because people were like, it's all personal, and it's all private, you know, and which, but it's great because then people little by little come out with more and some light bulbs go on. And one of the interesting learnings was instead of thinking about including people, let's start thinking about when we're excluding people. Because there's maybe small things we're doing that we don't think about. And it really is like, oh, people feel excluded by that. I think um, that might be at the root. And I know you've done some talks on Black Lives Matter as well. Mm -hmm. And that's a common thing I hear is people feel excluded by the right. Black Lives Matter. Why not all lives matter? That's the, the common reaction, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I think that there's different people who say all lives matter. There's people who are just out and out racist and have an issue with that. But there is also a group of people that actually, and I don't want to say this in any, any condescending way at all, but are really unaware of the importance of language and they don't understand why, and they're they have and they haven't had the experience of being excluded, right? Yeah, and I think a lot of it comes from that in either case, or they and, think they have, right? Like a yeah. reaction of a lot of international people living in Japan saying, "I've been excluded from things because I'm not Japanese." Well, that's not really the same that we're talking about right but the focus here is on i mean and i don't want to get too academic about it but really black lives matter is really looking at a system of slavery that was started and how it's perpetuated in every government and it isn't just the united states it's starting in the states because it's most obvious but to me it's exciting in this time to see how europeans are also questioning their colonial past to me, that's exciting in a positive way to show that, okay, this isn't just, oh, a recent American police thing, because then it's easy to say, right? Oh, that's, and I've been told that by many a European that racism is an American issue. And I will not talk about that today because I'll get very angry. But, uh, but once, if you sit down and talk with a lot of people, <laughs> sit on Zoom and talk with a lot of people about it. There's a good chunk of people that you cannot change their mind. Okay? And at some point, you just have to say, whatever. 
They came into this discussion ready to fight me on it. But there are some people that I do want to take the time. And I say this as an older person in my late 50s now. <laughs> when I was younger, I would have not have taken the time. I would have been just saying things that I do not want to say here today um, that would probably offend a lot of people. There's, I realize having been an activist for so long and being involved in so many groups that often we make an assumption that everybody knows. For example, what is LGBTI? And if you say, well, what's wrong with you? How could you not know what all of those things stand for? What are you, an idiot? Well, now you've lost a potential ally. There are people that need to be at the forefront of every movement. I feel in my life now, I don't need to be at the forefront. So for example, with the students who organize Black Lives Matter, no need to be in the forefront. But I told them, I'm happy to help you create checklists like schedules, how to work with the police, happy to do any of those things, happy to stand in the back. And if you need advice on the strategic stuff, I'm happy to do that. I've said that also to some university students who are working on um, a women's group at Temple, at Sophia, and other groups. I'm happy now. And part of the reason for that is when I was younger, we didn't necessarily have so many people happy to do that. Or actually, I was not so open to that. <laughs> Honestly, I was not so open to their advice. I frankly said to some you know, in the 80s to some of my professors, well, great, you did all this stuff in the 60s. Look at the world. It's still messed up. Now I realize it's a long-term game. <laughs> but you don't need to be in the front. And I think Black Lives Matter, it isn't white people should just shut up because silence perpetuates this. And there's also a lot of leaders who are white people who could be helping break down systems or bringing people in, bringing new leaders in. I really do see this time, you know, maybe COVID being stuck at home has given people a time to think and reflect. Maybe people are spending too much time on YouTube and um, watching and Instagram and watching all these videos. I think there's a, honestly, I think there's a, a lot of white people who've chosen not to see all those police videos. And now you can't escape it because you're at home and right. working 24 seven online. I mean, Black Lives Matter, the whole idea of diversity and inclusion is very much associated with SDG goals. It's very much associated with gender diversity, yeah. with minority yeah. marginalized groups being included, uh, people with disabilities. This is so connected to the NGO work that you do as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, inclusion, it's, and it's important for us to focus on Black Lives Matter because it's a very important systematic aspect. And I think that there's a, there's a saying in the PWD, Persons with Disabilities International Movement, nothing with, nothing without us if you're not with us. You can't talk on our behalf. Basically, and though these activists saying, oh, yeah, you know, we have to take care of persons with disabilities. And maybe it's a more recent thing to have this idea that we don't need to protect PWDs, right? Particularly in Japan. No, PW, this is about the whole human rights world. And if we look at AIDS activism, silence equals death. This is not just for persons living with HIV AIDS. This is also for black people in America and black people maybe in Britain um, and other countries um, or other ethnic or racial or religious minorities. We know that silence equals death applies to so many different contexts and nothing for us without us. This, uh, I said it wrong the first time. Don't do it for us. Be with us. Right. And, um, I saw actually interesting discussion in the Black Lives Matter group about some people just white guys writing white people just shut up. And this is not the time we're in. Everybody needs to speak loudly against injustice. Everybody needs to speak loudly. We need to speak in different forums, in different places, in different times to different people. Um, 
I think I told you JJ yesterday, I organized the Women's March of 2017 in Japan. And because of our time zone, we were the first, although we didn't get first in the news because for Japan, we were quite big, 500, 658 people, six times the size we thought we would get. Very excited about that. Um, but it was very interesting to see all the people holding the banner, not all, most of the people holding the banner in the front were the men. And I got kind of annoyed by that. I did not say that in the media or anything, but there is a place for support. And all these guys, they're great people. That's awesome. They were there leading, supporting. Um, but there's time for us to step back and be supporters. And we can achieve a lot there, enhancing networks, talking to different people that maybe the people who are leading don't have access to. So this is why white people just shut up. Nothing's going to change yeah. if the people in power just shut up. They have to take and a I, stand. I think image matters, right? Like oh, yeah. If, if you have a Black Lives Movement, movement protest, you want black people to be leaders you know you don't want white people to be at the front leading you have a women's march you want women to be holding the banner you know i mean yeah you're yeah. you're trying to make an image point as well as to be active that's wonderful to have support and people supporting each other um yes can we shift gears just a little bit we've sure. had a bunch of great comments by the way and i've been putting them up as we've been talking because i didn't okay. want to distract you but okay. just supportive comments no questions really so far um, okay don't, don't be afraid to ask questions yeah. people <laughs> i can take tough questions i might um, turn red but anyway <laughs> you i got from your website you have this building partnerships and collaboration eight week NGO training program. Do you want to talk about that a bit? Yeah. So this was actually, I was a little reluctant to do it. And actually I was convinced to do it basically by the head of continuing education in Japan at Temple University. He said, but this is what you do. And I was like, oh yeah, that's right. You know, for example, I worked for four years at a U.S. NGO Japan office where we basically built collaborations between Japanese and American NGOs. I worked for the Give to Asia Foundation for, for four, three and a half, four years, working on U donors from the U.S. wanted to support local communities in Tohoku. So sometimes they're businesses, sometimes they're families, sometimes they're other community groups. And then when I realized, oh, yeah, I have all this spirit experience from the years trying to connect. Sometimes it's, you know, NGOs and NGOs. Sometimes it's businesses. I've done a few of the CSR programs um, before sustainability was a question with some international companies trying to build partnerships with them, with local organizations in Japan. So basically that course is going to, part of it is going to be using case studies from my experience. Some of them will be online case studies, but we're going to start really basic with some basics of person to person. Cause you know, people, man, we're tough, right? <laughs> You know, how do we build better partnerships, collaborations between individuals? Then we go to different types, say NGO to NGO, like local organization to international, corporations and uh, community groups, governments and community groups, and then, then looking more like an SDG style. How do we get all of these different partners? And it's case study based. I'm not saying you're going to get all the answers in these eight weeks, but by looking at some different examples of what has worked and some challenges, hopefully, again, we can get some ideas. What can we do, whether it's in our company, in our small organization, our large organization? That's wonderful. And the application looks like it's already closed. That was in May. Oh, actually, we're, re we're relaunching it for the fall as well. Because of COVID-19, um, it was canceled because... Um, so we're going to redo it. It's going to start in the middle of September. Great. Um, Temple University has a, as a, I think, Japanese that's an information session this week and then English one in August. Mm -hmm. And so I think the first application deadline will be middle of August. Mm -hmm. And then the final application deadline, end of August. I think we start, we're starting September 10th or 14th, some like that beginning of the second week of yeah, August. Yeah, wonderful. Sorry. 
beginning of the second week of September we start. We'll, so. we'll try to put some links under the yeah. video later. Um, you, you. So part of your NGO training, of course, is talking about fundraising, it looks like, teaching people how to raise funds. Um, you've got conflict mediators. You've, you've done so much. But getting funding, of course, is a big part of it. I was reviewing uh, our talk from last August when <laughs> we talked, and you were saying it's really hard to just have international uh, fundraisers or international events in Japan with just Japan-based funding, that you really need to look around the world for funding. You wanna talk about that a little bit? Yeah, you know, I think funding diversity is the most important thing. To be dependent on one company, whether they're domestic or international, you see what might happen in any type of crisis, you lose everything. And, and there are organizations that have faced that. Um, so I've been trying to help through my Develop Yourself to inspire others to help those groups. We meet once a, meet, once a month on a Thursday, very different types of groups, trying to look at, okay, who's here? company-wise, foundation-wise, um, who's online, right? Now, we're, I did um, a workshop last month, which was about, it was supposed to be originally about uh, doing fundraising events, but, um, and I also gave a talk at the American Chamber of Commerce about this, what are groups doing online to raise money? And it was a big learning for me, too, because this is a new world. Mm -hmm. Not just a link, but events like in the States, there are groups having galas and things. So doing that, just doing events isn't enough. Just having members isn't enough. But this diversification now in this world is even more important. Just for example, in, in the spring, a number of the major organizations in Japan that have huge galas, they had their events planned in March. Well, all of those were canceled. Some of them were moved then to the summer because who knew, you know, that this would be going on? It was a fluke thing. So they moved them to the summer. Now those aren't happening. So now it's the fall, right? We're really hoping they can still have their events. And one of the reasons I had this talk with the American Chamber of Commerce, they want to suss out all the opportunities out there because we don't really know. I mean, and even if people can have in-person events, you know, in a ballroom of 500, you might only be able to have, say, 50, 100 people because of social distancing and safety guidelines. But maybe online, you could have people from all over the world take part in a, you know, have some entertainment, you know, have companies. I saw this in the States. People are doing this. You have some restaurants that do the takeout. Mm -hmm. back. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, everybody. That's uh, one of the problems with doing it during rainy season. Sometimes the whole system cuts out. All right. Uh, we have a, a last 10 minutes with Sarah Jean. Thank you so much for joining us again. Uh, do you want to talk about your future projects? You have so many exciting things happening, coming up. Yes. Tell us, tell us yes. about it. So um, we're continuing this Develop Yourself to Inspire Others workshop series in the fall. Um, and probably into 2020, 2021, we're thinking about a two-tiered system like the introductory and then more people who who know, say, a little bit about fundraising already, who know about events to go a bit more in depth. Um, actually, it's been working out really well online because we have people joining, people who've joined from Kyushu, from Aichi. So it's been that's been kind of nice. Um, we didn't know, so a lot of the regular people from Tokyo aren't coming online anymore, but it's brought in different people from different types of organizations, Fukushima. So that's great. Um, I'm hoping to do some more with Diversity Dojo, also in this Japan Alliance for Conflict Mediators. We were, so after Golden Week, we were really hoping to launch what we call Conflict Corner Place, where people can bring in their conflicts. We Most of us have been trained through the New York Peace Institute or for San Francisco Board, um, which is a conflict mediation group. Um, we've been training on and off since 2016-17. And um, maybe we've decided, you know, maybe it's time to just think we're going to do this online. Mm -hmm. um, so we practice once or twice a month for the last two years, practice different cases. But we'd like to start practicing more with people who 
bring in not legal cases because those things need to be done by lawyers, nothing Mm -hmm. involving crime because that's not, we're not law enforcement, but community cases, team cases. um, And it's really about getting people to talk to each other, to work out conflict on the one-to-one or in a group of three small group basis. So really hope to get that going. Um, whether it's weekly, monthly, we're still working that out. And this is something I've always believed is really important to communication, building direct communication with people. And there's many ways to do it. Um, so that's something I want to continue, um, you know, with COVID, honestly, all my, um, regular like consulting type of work for companies or whatever, it was just like, gone. So I've been doing a lot more online workshops and teaching, and I'm hoping to enhance my toolkit of that. I'll be doing a course actually on conflict mediation for undergraduates at, at Temple University. And at both Temple and Sophia, I'm doing course on social movements. At Sophia, it's focused on the global movements. And at Temple, it's more focused on American social movements. So what I'm hoping to get more um, online work, if we can't go in person, going, I think companies starting to feel a little bit more comfortable going back to this sustainable, how can we build sustainability inside our companies or with our customers and our networks? Mm-hmm. There's a lot of people doing this more at the global level, but again, I'm, I really want people at the small, medium business level to feel like they can make a change. How can we change what we're doing to be more inclusive, to be more environmentally friendly, to really show we're a tolerant agency? So really thinking beyond the people, profit, planet, but just in daily life. Mm, That's interesting. You, you've done in the past, um, seminars and consulting and, and workshops and things for Peace Boat or JICA. Is that yeah. also shifting to an online platform? Is that working so, or? I still haven't heard what's happening with JICA. I used to do trainings for about eight different types of JICA programs. I haven't done any, done, done any since last fall. And one of the issues is people need to get the visas to come to Japan. Um, usually by now I know what the fall is happening, but I think they don't know like what's happening yet for bringing people from, you know, 14 different countries. Oh, it's really hard. Yeah. Really yeah. difficult. I'm, I'm talking to a woman next week who runs Unitar in Hiroshima. Oh, right, and of right. course, the, all of their focus is bringing people from conflict nations to negotiate in Hiroshima. But I think same issue, right? You can't right. bring people from abroad right now. Yeah. Um, for one of the organizations I'm on the board of advisors for Asian rural Institute, uh, Ajagakuin, they're based in Tochigi prefecture. Usually I do one of the orientation workshops and maybe more like May they're here from April to December. Only 10 of the 25 participants could come this year, whether visa transportation, just the timing of coming to Japan at the end of March did not work out. Um, it means they're able to do a lot of social distancing is easier, um, and they can really meet each other, but financially, you know, the as an organization, it's much harder. We're trying to work out how to do a few more online workshops because usually you have trainers in the, every afternoon, you know, maybe only two people from outside a week, but still that's part of the experience too, right? That Mm -hmm. people from different countries meeting all these different trainers and seeing you on the screen for two hours is not the same. Yeah. Yeah. And the people overseas, the participants don't have the internet access. Uh, Not people from Myanmar or Mali, Malawi, they don't have the internet accessibility. Some of them do. Um, but when you're focused on marginalized peoples in developing countries, they generally don't have that consistency. In right. Them. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a picture on screen right now. The ARI program evaluation that yeah. you did. So that looks like a great program. Yeah. It's 
I think it's about 45 or 46 years now they've been running this training program, bringing people originally from Southeast Asian countries, then throughout Asia, and now throughout Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America, to Japan. So it's about almost 1,400 people from 57 countries, mostly focused on rural leaders, mostly focused on ethnic, racial, religious minorities. So people who have seen really tough things. And for about a year, I focused on interviewing people. I visited Sri Lanka, Philippines, interviewed leaders online. So I know how hard the internet access issue is. Wow, yeah. And I had two student, um, graduate students help me go through about 200 participants essays. And our focus was to really review the training and what people were able to use in their own countries to help them reinvigorate Mm. the curriculum for the 21st century. Wow. I that think, was exciting. Part. Yeah, really challenging, but really empowering and exciting. Wonderful. I hope in some way using technology that they have, that, yes. that it's possible to transition in some way, like maybe sending materials in advance. I know mail is an issue right now as well. Um, yeah. But then doing it by telephone, I mean, yeah. just finding ways that, that still work, right? Right. And a big some of the participants who don't read all the materials they get in advance are kind of surprised ARI does not work on, like, Japan is a high-technology company, everything is high-tech. We really work at what are the locally available resources, and, I mean, part of it is local uh, resource assessment, which is so so impactful for a lot of participants. Sometimes you're, well, we don't have this, we don't have this. Well, what do we have that we can make better use of? And not just, you know, environmentally sustainable resources, but also thinking what's the local knowledge, local technology. Um, I mean, it starts with simple things, even such as how do you make organic fertilizer? If you're a farmer, how do you use local throat things that would be thrown away to actually produce new products um and it doesn't have to be just agriculture their work and and a lot of the work they're doing starting like micro funding and microfinance um, groups locally and thinking about what do we have because if you send all this technology over who has the knowledge to to not only use it, but when things break down to fix it, but um, or the fuel to run it, or do you have an electrical grid to run it? There's all of these things that maybe big aid agencies think like, let's pour new technology in there. Well, who does it create business for? And not to be negative, I'm just being honest here. It creates business for our companies in our technologically advanced com countries, right? But how can we use local resources and help them go like level up. It's not keeping people back. It's actually helping people create businesses economically sustainable, fine, uh, environmentally sustainable, and community-wise sustainable. Right. And it does empower different people who might be left out of those bigger scheme, schemes as well. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a very complex issue. There's no send money and it'll fix it kind of problem, <laughs> is it? Uh, Otherwise we have, it would have been done. Yeah. <laughs> We, we have a great question from Selena Hoy. Uh, do you think the attitudes have changed in recent years for people in Japan to focus on domestic problems rather than assuming that charity should be directed overseas? She says the plastic bag law comes to mind, for example. Mm. That's a great question, Selena. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I... Sometimes I say yes to this, and sometimes I say yes because I, I was feeling for a while, particularly before uh, 311, that all the issues and working with community groups, like, yes, we need to help refugees out there. We need to do something out there. I think if we can take this opportunity, plastic bag law, COVID-19, thinking about how different people are being impacted, vulnerable populations in Japan, if we can draw the lines or help connect the dots, I think we can do that. Um, you know, a few years ago, there was a company, a brand, I forgot. I'm not well-versed in all the big brands that came out with a bag to promote people bringing their own bag. 
and it said, this is not a plastic bag and it sold out right away. But because it was so expensive or whatever, people were using plastic bags to fill. Right. So there's a le learning opportunity, say, with this plastic bag thing, whether it's, you know, the Fudoshki system or a branded bag. But if people are just going to put another plastic bag inside, it's shown that we need to help people. And that's something as in the nonprofit world or in the educational world. Yeah. You know, we have a big responsibility. Don't just say, okay, throw people a bag. Yeah. It's, it's all about um, many levels of education, many levels of consumer education, many levels, <laughs> levels yeah. of interaction with actual pollution. You know, if once you throw it away and it's gone and you never see or hear about it again, you're not going to be that aware of how to reduce your consumption. But if part of your school project or part of your work project is to go and clean up along the river or the beach, it's going to make you more aware, right? So there's so many different levels of consciousness, yeah. awareness that we need to develop in some way. So from information to action or behavior change, there's many steps, right? You know, some people say, oh, I don't want to see those pictures of the whales with their stomach cut open and all the plastic. I've seen that. And people have kind of gotten used to that. But the experience, um, you know, maybe if they went to, you know, one of the, like in Hamamatsu here in Shizuoka, there's a whale, uh, not a whale, sorry, turtle sanctuary. Going there has a huge impact on people when they see why there are these rules for when you can go to the beach, when you can't, why you can or can't behave a certain way. Because if you see the pictures of the turtles, with the plastic around them that like seeing it in person i'm sorry that it takes that yeah or or going from another direction like what alana bunzi is doing with her fujishima beach clean but right. also she's doing art projects like you were talking about doing plays and you mm -hmm. know doing things creative or from a different angle which you might get a different group of people interested who would never even pay attention to the normal way to divert this information right yeah you know, there's this center in the, there's this organization in New York called the Center for Artistic Activism, which exactly does that training. And they're very active in this uh, international campaign called Free the COVID Virus, which is to make the uh, vaccine is to make the vaccine for the virus accessible to all people in all countries. So we don't have what happened with the HIV AIDS vaccine, which was, OK, if you have twenty thousand dollars a month, you can there is no vaccine, but original treatments. If you have $20,000 to pay a month, you can have access to the best treatment in the world. Um, so, but they work with local, whether it be artists, whether you make textiles, music, how do we incorporate this into our activism to promote social justice? And that's so much more important than, sorry, I do this online webinar two hours. I don't think I'm changing people's behavior i'm just that entry point that iriguchi for a lot of people information mm. yeah sounds like you have, there's some crying babies it's the cats i've oh, rescued okay. i've rescued kittens um okay. and their mom is outside and i'm sorry oh. but yeah that's my okay. reality right now at <laughs> home <I'm> sorry. <laughs> Honestly, it like no no it really <laughs> does sound like babies um on screen right now i have your you can help list for covid from your website and I would really recommend people go and look at Sarah Jean's website. Before I forget, sarahjeanrosito.wordpress.com. And you can get updates on her upcoming events. Her blog is there. And in the blog is things like this. Do you want to introduce this list a little bit before we sign off? So I have a few different things up there, but one thing is I put out a monthly newsletter about events. I mean, a lot of the events today are online, but still that means people can participate, not just in Tokyo, although it's still called Tokyo Community News. I um, mean, I've been doing this basically as a hobby so, since I returned to Japan from working on the 2004 presidential election. Ah, for another, wow. for another interview, another day. Um, 
And I just thought people need access to information in English in Tokyo so they can figure out how to get involved. Yeah. Um, and it's, I send it out by mail once a month, but I also put it online once a month, basically, um, cut and pasting. And it's a way of sharing information like Selena's with tell Tokyo English lifeline, refugees international run for the cure. And it's just a way for us to keep sharing information with our different networks. Yeah. Wonderful. And people can also find you on LinkedIn and Facebook as well. Yes. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Facebook. I have a page. Um, we also have a page for develop yourself to inspire others where people share different types of training information. Um, there's also, I think the link for women of the world, Tokyo, which is the women's March group. We started here in Japan in 2016. Actually, we started it just after Boris Johnson became prime minister. We knew Trump was going to win that night. Um, or when Brexit, that was the night. It was the night that Brexit happened, and then we reinforced it after Boris Johnson became prime minister. May was still prime minister at the time, but Brexit night, it was a drunken night. So, <laughs> uh, And then you wake up to a new reality, like many yeah. of us are now with COVID and trying yeah. to find ways where we can adjust and, and work and move yeah. forward proactively, right? Because we, yes, there's always going to be another challenge in front of us. And I know people hate this thing out of every challenge comes opportunity, but, and I don't even like the phrase new normal because this is society's dynamic. There's always new challenges, but there's always opportunities, but not everybody has access to the opportunities. Maybe you or I do, right? So you can enhance whatever work you're doing using this amazing, you know, live interview program, right? This will, this is an opportunity to bring in new people maybe who wouldn't have been able to come in and think about what you're doing for the future. If we have the opportunities, you know, we can help other people have more opportunities as well. Cause everybody's Definitely. having a difficulty economically or socially or whatever yeah. at different times. And we don't, but we don't all have the same resources. That's right. Sorry. Yeah. And I could talk about this for six days. No, no. And thank you so much. And we will definitely, I would love to follow up with you in a few months time because things with COVID are changing so fast and we don't really know what our next step of reality is going to be, but for sure it's going to involve wanting to promote what people are doing and support you know, people who are left out of mainstream funding and, you know, lots of issues that we've been talking about today. So thank you. Yes. And I'll also send you the link for the publication we have coming out about the yes. impact of COVID on vulnerable populations, refugees, orphans. Yeah. Definitely. Thank you so Definitely. much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody for joining. Sorry again about the, the cutoff. Uh, we got there in the end, and I will put the videos together for YouTube so you can check it out all in one piece there. Um, tomorrow again at 5 p.m., we're talking about travel in Shikoku Island, so please join us. Thank Great. you so much, Sarah Jean. Everybody Thank have you. a good day. Take care. Bye.